Hi, uh, this is the recorded version of the in-class lecture on panic disorder and agoraphobia. So in this lecture, we're going to review the three P's model of etiology of psychopathology. And then we're going to introduce sort of a new focus for these next three lectures on panic disorder, agoraphobia, selective anxiety, sorry, social anxiety, selective mutism, generalized anxiety, and separation anxiety, where we really focus on the beliefs and the behavior that perpetuate symptoms. The two disorders that we're gonna focus on today are panic disorder and agoraphobia. So again, this model of etiology focuses on predisposing factors or traits, experiences in the environment or with parenting or psychological factors like beliefs and learning history that make someone more likely to develop a disorder. And taken all together, these are known as biopsychosocial risk or vulnerability factors. The anxiety disorders that we're gonna talk about for the most part have overlapping shared predisposing factors. What really differentiates the anxiety disorders from each other are the precipitating factors, the events that directly lead to their development and the perpetuating factors or the specific behaviors, beliefs and experiences that lead to the persistence or worsening of symptoms. And again, psychologists really intervene on the perpetuating factors when we're treating people with psychopathology. We try to identify and then work to change the thoughts and behaviors that are keeping people impaired, that are keeping people anxious. Another way to think about this or sort of a more um, like process focused model to think about this is that predisposing influences along with protective influences or biopsychosocial factors that make someone less likely to get an illness interact and go into determining someone's cumulative risk. There are some people who have enough cumulative risk who have enough like predisposition to anxiety that they can develop an anxiety disorder without any clear environmental precipitant. They're kind of just born anxious. Um, for most people with anxiety disorders, there is some kind of precipitating in in incident or influence that leads to the development of an anxiety disorder. And with panic disorder in particular, there's always a precipitating incident. Once the anxiety disorder develops at the onset of that anxiety disorder, Perpetuating influences, so the beliefs and behaviors that maintain symptoms, interact with ameliorating influences, um, which are influenced by protective factors and which help to, um, which influence whether someone recovers quickly from their disorder or whether it persists. These things together influence the persistence of anxiety disorders. So the model that we're going to be using to talk about precipitating and perpetuating factors is gonna look like this. We're gonna first identify what factor was present at the onset, what factor influenced the development of the disorder. Then we're gonna to try to identify for each disorder what specific beliefs about the world or about anxiety or about the self actually perpetuate symptoms and contribute to behavior that perpetuates symptoms or avoidance behavior. Sorry, that was the class poll. So applying this model to specific phobia, which we've already talked about, for most people, the precipitating factor, the onset of specific phobia, comes from some kind of cl like classical conditioning incident, a negative experience with the phobic object or a false alarm having an anxiety response in the presence of what becomes a phobic object. That object then becomes a conditioned stimulus for anxiety in the future. The beliefs that influence whether that initial conditioning event turns into an anxiety disorder have to do with whether people actually believe that their phobic object is really dangerous and that it really should be avoided, or if they just believe that the anxiety that it makes them feel, whether or not there is any actual danger, is itself intolerable and too uncomfortable. And so they're motivated to avoid just because they can't handle feeling anxious or they think they can't handle it. Avoidance is the behavior that perpetuates phobia and every anxiety disorder. And in the case of specific phobia, avoidance means avoiding the phobic object or situation or getting out of that situation as soon as you encounter it. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about panic disorder, which you can sort of think of as anxiety about an individual's own fear response. So panic disorder is defined by recurrent panic attacks and by fear of another panic attack that causes the person to change their behavior in some way to try to avoid having a panic attack. Panic attacks themselves aren't unique to panic disorder. They're alone not diagnostic of panic disorder. Other um, anxiety disorders and other disorders in general can cause panic attacks. Being in a state of physiological anxiety means that your nervous system is more primed to have a fear response. So any disorder that makes you chronically anxious means that you're more prone to having a panic attack because your nervous system is just more ready for it. 
Many specific disorders other than panic disorder involve having really intense fear responses that are triggered by events or emotions. So for example, people with specific phobias often have panic attacks when they are exposed to their phobic situation or object. Some people with social anxiety disorder experience panic attacks or panic symptoms in social settings. When people with OCD are unable to perform their rituals, um, it can lead to a panic attack. When people with PTSD are exposed to an environment or of internal state that triggers a trauma memory, they can have panic attacks. When people with ARFID are challenged to eat an unfamiliar or disliked food, that can trigger an intense fear response and panic attacks. And when people with anorexia and bulimia nervosa eat a food that they fear because of weight gain or eat at a time when they don't want to or see their weight on the scale, this can trigger an extreme fear response that can lead to a panic attack. And in none of these examples would the person be diagnosed with panic disorder because it's only panic disorder if the patient both fears and avoids panic attacks themselves. And typically the panic attacks can't be attributed to another disorder. So the panic attacks can't be, they don't only happen in response to social situations or they don't only happen when someone is trying to eat. Panic attacks themselves are really common with almost a third of adults experiencing a panic attack in their lifetime um, and about 10% of people experiencing a panic attack each year. Those numbers are actually probably higher because many people when they experience panic attacks don't realize that that's what's happening. They think that it's a medical emergency or they think that it's something else physical, like it was triggered by too much caffeine or it was because of a medical illness or like altitude sickness or they had a fever or they didn't get a good night's sleep the night before. Panic attacks are really physical. So often if you don't know what's happening to you, you would attribute it to a physical cause. So probably 28% is an underestimate of how common panic attacks are. Compared to how common panic attacks themselves are though, panic disorder is relatively rare with about a 3% point prevalence and about 5% of people meeting criteria for panic disorder in their lifetime. Um, about twice as many women than men are diagnosed with panic disorder, which is interesting because we know that the prevalence of panic attacks is the same in men and women. So gender differences in coping behaviors and in the way that people avoid may contribute to why men are less diagnosed with panic disorder. So men are more likely to avoid using substances than they are to use behavioral avoidance. Male gender roles or expectations for men may just encourage more men to put themselves in stressful situations or face their fears. This is an ameliorating influence. It's something that prevents the perpetuation of a disorder. So men may have more ameliorating influences because of their gender and because of gender roles. Men may also make different attributions about panic attacks, and this goes into the beliefs that perpetuate panic disorder. Panic disorder typically has an acute onset, which means it just comes out of nowhere. Um, and in this instance, it comes out of nowhere in the form of that first panic attack. That's the precipitating event. The most common age of onset is the early 20s. So panic attacks have a lot of physical symptoms and also some very specific cognitive symptoms. But all of these experiences are directly caused by the physiological activation that's happening during a panic attack. This is what your body does when you're in a life or death situation. These are all sensations that you would have, but probably not notice if you were fighting for your life or if you were running away from a murderer um, or if you were about to jump out of a plane without a parachute. When you're having a panic attack, there's no actual danger in your environment. So all of your focus and all of your attention goes to these physical sensations including racing heart, sweating, trembling and shaking, feeling like you're choking, feeling chest pain or pressure, feeling nausea or stomach pain, feeling dizzy and lightheaded, feeling chills or hot flashes, feeling tingling in your extremities. And this is accompanied by what people often describe as just this overwhelming sense of dread that something awful is gonna happen. Typically people attach that feeling of dread to a fear that they're gonna lose control or go crazy or a fear that they're gonna die but those fears come from a physiological state. Their body is reacting as if they are going to die. People also often experience mild dissociation during a panic attack where they just sort of feel unreal, like they're watching what's happening to them from outside their body. So this is a first person perspective on what it's like to have a panic attack. I'm just gonna play this for a little bit, um, but you can watch the full video on your own if you're curious. every single time. Some panic attacks are lighter, and some are stronger. Depends on the situation. But um, this is just the things that I have felt personally during a panic attack. The first one is being 
terrified. Like, you know, sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night from this free fall feeling. So you feel like you're falling, and for a split second, you're panicked. If you prolong this for anywhere from five to 30 minutes, that's pretty much a panic attack. You might feel tightness in the chest and uh, not having enough air, which is the thing that causes you to hyperventilate, which is breathing too much oxygen in. But I would recommend you to cover your mouth with a bath and with your hands, because what that's going to make you feel is dizzy. You're going to feel dizzy and lightheaded. Um, you might experience some blurred vision because of this and muffled hearing. So processing information in general is very, very hard. You might feel nauseous. Um, I think it's quite normal for your digestive system to shut down in times of stress. Some people throw up. I personally don't. I just feel like this all in my throat. Okay. If you watch the video about of me getting panic attack, I would at the end of it, I put my hand on my neck to feel my pulse. It's because your heart might feel like it's beating too fast or it's beating too strong. So you would hear it in the ears. And what I'm doing there is I'm putting my hand on my pulse to consciously feel and count that it's indeed normal. Because you feel like it's going off the charts and your heart is just about to explode, but it, it's not actually. So two important takeaways about panic attacks from that video. One is that they are short-lived and they're self-limiting. Your sympathetic nervous system isn't designed to remain in that state of intense high activation for very long. It's only meant to last as long as it takes for you to escape or fight against a, a dangerous situation. So panic attacks are naturally self-limiting. They tend to only last somewhere between five and 30 minutes. Um, the other feature of panic attacks is that Many people, as they're having a panic attack, believe that they will just keep getting worse and worse, that the intensity will continue to escalate. And that contributes to a lot of the fear of having another panic attack. You kind of feel like if I don't make this stop, it's just going to keep getting worse until I literally die because that's what it feels like in your body. But just like they're self-limiting in terms of how long they last, they're also self-limiting in terms of how intense they are. Your body has basically a ceiling for how anxious you can get, for how high your heart rate can get, for how dizzy you can get during a panic attack. Um, typically they tend to peak in intensity relatively quickly. So kind of just knowing that they're self-limiting and that they won't continue getting more and more intense indefinitely if you don't do something can sometimes be enough to help someone with panic disorder learn to not fear and not avoid their panic attacks. Your limp. So panic attacks are false alarm fear responses. Your body is reacting as if your life is in immediate danger when in fact there's no real danger in your environment. When you're in that intense physiological state of total fight or flight activation, your cognition is influenced by that. Your brain is basically looking for things in your environment, whether that's your external environment or your body's internal environment to attach those feelings to. It's adaptive for us to be able to form fear learning. For our caveman ancestors, they needed to be able, when they were being chased by a tiger, to automatically learn without having to try, without distracting any of their conscious attention from the task of running away and saving their lives. Their body had to be able to pair that emotion, that fear, that need to escape with what was happening right before it was triggered. Because then if there was an actual danger that triggered that fear response, you know to avoid it again. And the way that you know to avoid it again is that when you start to get close to it in the future, you start to feel a fear response creeping up that's conditioned fear. It's your body's way of saying, this situation is dangerous. The last time we were in this situation, we almost died. So you should avoid the situation. The problem is that panic attacks are false alarms. So when people form conditioned associations between that fear response and the cues present during a panic attack, they're forming conditioned fear associations to things that are benign and safe usually things that were happening within their own body right before the panic attack started. So panic disorder is characterized by cognitively anxiety about fear, fear of having a future panic attack, and uh, by having conditioned panic responses to benign stimuli that were present at the beginning of a panic attack in the past. So the etiology of panic disorder, starting with predisposition, some people are more predisposed to panic than others. These are people who tend to have stronger more sensitive sympathetic nervous system reactions whose bodies are just better at going into that fight or flight response. 
and also people who form relatively rapid fear learning, who are good at forming um, associations between feelings of fear and sensations in their body and things in their environment that can then trigger that fear in the future. The precipitation of panic disorder is that first panic attack. And initially what perpetuates it, what takes someone from having a panic attack to the beginnings of panic disorder, are their beliefs about what that panic attack means. Uh, many people when they have their first panic attack think that they did almost die. And they may come to believe that the things that they did to try to calm down or try to avoid the panic actually saved their lives. So they, when they had that first panic attack, they may have gone to the hospital, they may have done deep breathing exercises, they may have breathed into a plastic or a paper bag. Don't breathe into a plastic bag, that's very dangerous. Um, but all those things that they did probably didn't do much to end the panic attack, it just ended on its own. But because they believed that their lives were actually in danger, they may believe that it's necessary to do everything that they can to prevent a panic attack from happening in the future. At the same time, when you have that panic attack, you're forming conditioned fear associations between the conditions that were present when you had the panic attack and the panic itself. So in the future, when those conditions are present, it can start to trigger elevated anxiety. And if you believe that panic attacks are dangerous or that you can't handle them, noticing those conditioned cues and noticing that initial increase in anxiety can trigger future panic attacks and it can motivate avoidant behavior. So changing your life, going out of your way to avoid condition stimuli for panic, whether that's internal sensations like being out of breath from exercising, being hot from going outside in the summer, um, being dizzy from like smoking pot or something, all of those sensations that were present during a panic attack become conditioned fear stimuli. So people with panic disorder eliminate all of them to try to avoid having a panic attack in the future. Zooming in on the perpetuating influences, each panic attack is, an un, is a, in a way an unconditioned stimulus. It's aversive and inherently unpleasant to feel that much fear. So each panic attack is the opportunity for more conditioned fear associations to be learned, for more cues in the body and in the environment to be linked to the sensation of having a panic attack. When people avoid those cues in the future, it prevents safety learning. It prevents them from learning that they won't always have a panic attack when those cues are present. And when the presence of those condition stimuli does raise anxiety, because many of these condition stimuli are pretty difficult to avoid, since most of them are just internal changes that happen in response to anxiety, and also in response to just random events in the environment, their presence raises anxiety and triggers future panic attacks. So put another way, people's beliefs about panic influence how fearful they are of panic attacks and how worried they are about having them in the future. So beliefs about panic, like this means that I'm going crazy or this means that I'm having a heart attack, this could actually kill me, this could last forever, or just, I know it's not dangerous, but it would be really embarrassing or really problematic to have a panic attack in a public place or at work or on a date. All of these beliefs about panic being dangerous or intolerable lead to increased attention to the condition stimuli that are associated with panic and to increases in cognitive anxiety when you notice those stimuli happening. So again, these stimuli are usually early signs of anxiety. So increases in heart rate, breathlessness that can be caused by anxiety. So panic attacks are more likely to happen when you're stressed out or in an anxious state, but they can also be caused by physical exertion or being in a hot room. But either way, as soon as you start to notice these sensations, it activates your catastrophic beliefs that these sensations mean I'm going to have a panic attack, which means I'm gonna go crazy or I'm gonna have a heart attack or I'm gonna humiliate myself. And those thoughts lead to increased anxiety, which increases the sensations in your body that are associated with anxiety and also condition stimuli for panic. This leads to a panic attack and the cycle continues. So to review, the precipitation or the onset of panic disorder comes with that first panic attack. Panic attacks are false alarms, but that fight or flight fear response leads to the development of conditioned stimuli for future panic attacks. People who believe that panic attacks are dangerous or intolerable are more motivated to avoid, to try to predict and prevent panic attacks in the future and to avoid conditioned panic cues and places. So again, when someone who is really motivated to avoid panic starts to notice those early signs of anxiety, those conditioned cues for panic in their body, 
because they're afraid of panic, because they want to try to avoid it. They start to pay a lot of attention to it. They start to do everything they can to try to control it and tamp it down. But that usually has the opposite effect of increasing your anxiety, which increases the number of conditioned panic cues that are present in your body and makes you more likely to have a panic attack. So because most of the conditioned cues for panic are pretty impossible to avoid, many people with panic attacks, or sorry, with panic disorder, end up avoiding a lot of places and activities where it would either be more likely that they would have a panic attack because of because those activities make them anxious or because those activities contribute to physical arousal or where they think it would be dangerous or embarrassing to have a panic attack. And when people with panic disorder start to avoid certain activities because they don't wanna have a panic attack while doing those activities, this leads to the development of agoraphobia. So agoraphobia is characterized by fear of anxiety about two or more situations um, that broadly are, are situations where it would be difficult to escape or difficult to get help if something bad happened. So the situations that people with agoraphobia tend to fear are being on public transportation, being in big open spaces, or being in tight enclosed spaces, standing in lines, or when agoraphobia is really severe, just being outside at all. In agoraphobia, these situations always provoke fear and are always avoided, and the fear and anxiety that they provoke isn't proportional to the real danger. So again, if the fear is of having a panic attack, that fear is disproportionate to the real danger because although panic attacks feel terrible, they're not dangerous. Usually the way that people caught, like, experience and articulate the fear and agoraphobia is that they would say they don't wanna be in a situation where they couldn't escape or they couldn't get help if they had a panic attack or if some other feared outcome were to happen. Agoraphobia is more, much more common in men than in women, more commonly diagnosed. And again, this is really related to gender norms and gender roles that go into both predisposing, so the tendency to have elevated sympathetic arousal, the tendency to form fear conditioning and operant behavior influenced by negative reinforcement related to fear, but also gender roles influencing perpetuating versus ameliorating factors and men maybe having more societal pressure to face fears and not avoid, which contributes to the amelioration of risk for anxiety disorders. A misconception about agoraphobia is that people with agoraphobia are stuck in the house. Being completely housebound is actually a very severe but relatively rare manifestation of agoraphobia. What's much more common is that people tolerate being in these feared situations with a lot of distress. And often they engage in what's known as safety behaviors to try to reduce or control their anxiety in these situations. Safety behaviors are basically kind of the opposite of condition stimuli for fear. These are condition stimuli that people have come to associate with calming down or with feeling safe in the past. So again, when people are having panic attacks, especially at first when they think that it actually means that there's something medically wrong with them, they often like will do a lot of things to try to stop the panic attack. And because panic attacks are self-limiting and they stop on their own, eventually something that you do or something that you have or someone that you're with or a situation that you're in is going to become paired, conditioned association with calming down from a panic attack. And that can become a safety signal or safety behavior. So most people with panic disorder meet criteria for agoraphobia. So the epidemiology of agoraphobia is kind of similar to the epidemiology of panic disorder, um, but the lifetime prevalence is actually around six to 6.5% versus the 5% prevalence of panic disorder because about 1% of people with agoraphobia don't also have panic disorder. So other disorders that can contribute to agoraphobia, basically you can think about it as any disorder where people are afraid of something bad and uncontrollable happening from within their body. So people with emetophobia, people with irritable bowel syndrome who kind of have a lot of fear and anxiety about losing control of their bowels, people who have real medical illnesses that could lead to balance problems or being a fall risk or people who have allergies that can lead to anaphylaxis um, may develop some agoraphobia about being in situations where they couldn't get help for their medical condition right away. And then any disorder that can cause panic responses, really intense fear responses, can also lead to agoraphobia as people try to avoid being in situations where they couldn't readily escape if they had a fear response. 
So this is an example from Reddit of some of the safety behaviors that this individual with emetophobia engages in to manage her anxiety on a road trip. So being in a car, stuck in a car, um, is a trigger for agoraphobia and something that people with emetophobia tend to avoid. But she manages the anxiety that she feels with ginger kombucha, mint gum, pepsid, and CBD oil. So these are all things that may help to mitigate nausea, but which are also conditioned safety signals for anxiety. When she has these things with her, she feels more calm. She feels like if the worst were to happen, if she were to have to throw up, these things would somehow make that experience more controllable or better. So these are conditioned safety signals. This is someone's account of what irritable bowel syndrome is like for them and how it contributes to, a, to agoraphobic avoidance. So they say that their number one IBS trigger, so their trigger for stomach pain and urgency, is being out and about away from a bathroom. Suddenly I'll start thinking about it and my urgency will kick in. If I'm at home chilling and I'm around bathrooms, I'm pretty much fine, but otherwise it makes me really anxious and uncomfortable. So that anxiety about not being able to find a bathroom actually contributes to anxious sensations, which for people with IBS are conditioned stimuli for anxiety and for stomach pain, just like signs of anxious arousal that are present early in a panic attack are conditioned stimuli for panic and people with panic disorder. So this person's anxiety about being out of the house, which then leads to feelings of stomach pain, discomfort, and urgency, has made them virtually unable to get into cars or other modes of transportation, as well as be anywhere where a bathroom is not present without feeling panicky and getting that sense of urgency. So again, this is an example of someone who has agoraphobia, engages in a lot of avoidance, is fearful about situations that are not easy to leave, but the feared outcome isn't a panic attack, it's urgency to go to the bathroom. So agoraphobia can take on a life of its own. It can become really generalized and it can become kind of dissociated from panic attacks or whatever the feared consequence was that initially motivated it through avoidance. So avoidance makes anxiety worse and agoraphobia can start off with a specific fear and then become generalized over time. So what more generalized agoraphobia might look like is when the avoidance of places and activities becomes sort of decoupled from fear of having a panic attack and just becomes about the activity being seen as scary in and of itself. As agoraphobia develops and gets worse, people eventually start to feel conditioned fear anytime their safety signals aren't present. So that person with emetophobia, the absence of kombucha, the absence of CBD oil, the absence of mint gum is enough to trigger anxiety and feelings of physiological fear. So whereas for most people without anxiety disorders and without agoraphobia, there are specific conditions stimuli that might trigger fear for them. People with really advanced agoraphobia, they need condition stimuli to signal safety. And without those, everything seems dangerous and everything is enough to trigger a conditioned fear response. So agoraphobia interestingly can also develop for the first time or a, like sort of low level subclinical agoraphobic tendencies can get worse after a long period of being homebound for reasons that weren't initially driven by panic and anxiety. So there's a further reading at the end of this lecture set or slide set about the impact of COVID quarantines on people's agoraphobia. But this is just an example from Reddit of someone with social anxiety disorder who develops agoraphobia related to their social anxiety, but precipitated by having to be quarantined for COVID. So due to COVID, there's been a strict stay at home order and I've been increasingly anxious to go outside, especially alone. Just going outside to take the garbage out freaks me out. I keep wanting to take a walk across the street or to the park, but I'm afraid someone will see me and judge me, which is social anxiety disorder. I'm afraid my neighbors will see me or say hi, and I won't know how to act. This fear is a lot less when I go outside the house with my partner. I'll try to take the trash out, but I can't make myself leave the door, so I just keep putting it off. I think my social anxiety and depression has been amped up by the pandemic and the lack of working and also feeling isolated. I've never previously experienced the fear of going outside, but I have had social anxiety most of my life. I feel like I need to be relaxed enough to leave the house. I'm scared my neighbors or passerby are judging me or watching me. So two things. One is that for people with social anxiety disorder, every social interaction is an opportunity for safety learning. And when those opportunities are taken away by something like COVID quarantine, forcing people to become really socially isolated, that can lead to worsening symptoms or sort of a relapse of social anxiety disorder when you lose your opportunities for repeated safety learning and habituation.
But this idea that I need to be relaxed enough to leave the house is really common to people with agoraphobia. Most people with agoraphobia will tell you, it's not that I can't go to the grocery store. It's not that I can't stand in lines. I can just only do it on a good day. But what it means for something to be a good day is kind of subjective and can shift a lot. So if you have to scan your body for any sign of anxiety before you can leave the house, it's really likely that most of the time you'll find something. So agoraphobia tends to get worse over time with avoidance, just like all anxiety disorders. So the perpetuating factors for agoraphobia. This is, this is thinking about agoraphobia as kind of a standalone phenomenon when agoraphobia becomes almost independent of the panic disorder or whatever initially caused it. Agoraphobia becomes this sort of standalone independent disorder when people start to develop condition safety cues. So objects, behaviors, or rituals, people, or places that are associated with safety from feared consequences that are conditioned cues that trigger relaxation and calming down. Having these safety cues means that in the absence of those safety cues, you're basically experiencing condition stimuli for the opposite, for fear and anxiety and panic. Beliefs that perpetuate agoraphobia are basically the belief that experiencing whatever your feared consequence is, whether it's a panic attack or IBS or throwing up, would be intolerable or dangerous if it happened in the wrong place. And then the avoidance has to do with trying to predict and prevent the feared outcome. So making sure it's a good day before you leave the house, scanning your body, making sure you're relaxed enough to interact with the world, avoiding conditioned cues and places for fear and panic, but then ultimately in the long run, the type of avoidance that's really specific to agoraphobia is this reliance on safety signals and safety cues. And just to kind of clarify the difference between safety learning and safety signals, is that in safety learning, what people are really learning is that in if your life really is safe, like if you're, you know, your hierarchy of needs is being met and you live in a basically safe environment, your nervous system should learn that the default option is to feel safe. Unless there's a conditioned stimulus for danger or an unconditioned stimulus for danger present, your nervous system needs to know that your default resting state should be relaxed and safe and comfortable. What safety signals teach your nervous system in contrast is that unless this thing is present, you're unsafe. So this thing is what signals safety and its absence signals danger. So safety learning is generalized. You feel safe unless something tells you otherwise. Safety signals are specific. You're only safe if this cue is present. So safety learning promotes approach and normal functioning, whereas safety signals promote avoidance when they're not available. If this object or person or behavior is not present, your nervous system reacts as though you're in danger. So an example would be if you had like a lucky pencil that you used to take exams as if anyone takes exams with paper and pencil anymore, but whatever. So say you had to have this pencil with you in order to feel comfortable taking a test. That pencil is not actually allowing you to take the test. It's not making you smarter. It's not making you know more. It's signaling that you don't need to be anxious. What safety learning or inhibitory learning, so taking the test without the pencil present, would do is help you learn that under average typical conditions you can function. Okay, so that's the end. There's some further reading in case you're interested, and I will see you in class.